Hey kids, welcome back to Rob's Red Hotspot and my ongoing tutorial series for Hearts of Iron 3, their finest hour. Uh, this episode we are going to be talking all about production. Uh, last episode we talked about a lot of key concepts, um, and what I'm trying to do in this episode is give you enough information about production, division design, and uh, the value of different units, uh, and some of the some of the core mechanics behind production, so that you know. Pretty soon we'll be able to actually start playing the game and advancing the clock. So what I'm going to do to start here is I'm going to actually pick let's let's pick the USA and let's go to uh, the 1944 scenario. As I've mentioned in the past, I don't recommend playing this scenario, but loading up this uh, this scenario will allow us to look at some of the late game units that uh, that you you won't have access to in the 1936 start. Uh, you will of course get access to them as you research technologies, but you won't have them from the start. So I'll also probably be tag switching a bit between the USA and the Soviets and the Germans and other major powers maybe to to look at because uh, not every country uh, has every type of unit available. So I think what we're going to do to start is look at we're going to start with land units. Um, and we're going to look at the different types of, of brigades and the and you know how to make divisions and stuff like that. Before we jump into this uh, production interface, though, let's let's take a look. Uh, I'm not going to go through the order of battle in detail in this, but uh, for the time being, uh, what you should understand. So just kind of ignore these HQ units for now. What you should understand is that uh, Hearts of Iron Three f functions. Uh, what 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 you control as the leader of your country is divisional level combat. So you, it's very rare that you will issue an order to an individual brigade. You you'll mostly be uh, issuing orders to to divisions. You can you can separate these out uh, by clicking that button there or by pressing the R hotkey, and you can make an individual brigade like that. But uh, it's not. Uh, it's not generally. It's not what you're going to do, and there's a, you 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 don't generally want to use uh, divisions that uh, that only have one one brigade in them. You want to use divisions that have at least two brigades in them, and preferably four or even five. So when we talk about division composition, uh, that's what we're talking about. Is you know which divisions, which types of brigades are you choosing to put in these divisions, and and what makes a, what makes a well-rounded division for the for the for the purpose of this game. Uh, let's. Uh, oh, one one other thing I'd like to say as well is I'm going to give you a lot of tips as to some of the more optimal division compositions. Uh, but you should also know that the AI. Uh, if we go quickly in the screen here, the AI uses division compositions that from based on templates, basically based on templates from uh, that are kind of set up historically, and those division compositions are not optimal. So you you know as tempting as it is to try and make every single division perfect and have exactly the right support units and the right mix of statistics and stuff like that. Uh, uh, it's actually not going to make or break your game in most cases unless you're playing a weaker country. It's not going to make or break your game because you're typically going to be fighting divisions that are not as well designed as your own. Even And that's true even if you're playing as, I don't know, uh, you know, an, al an allied country versus Ger a very powerful Germany or, or what have you, or if you're playing, even if you're playing as the Soviet Union and your technology is a little bit behind and you're fighting Germany, uh, in ter if, if you follow these these division composition instructions, uh, you should be in pretty good shape fighting them. And, uh, you know, you also, as, as tempting as it is to argue over what the perfect infantry division composition is, it's kind of a moot point to a certain degree because the AI just doesn't do that good a job at it. So I, I think that how you, do, you, you choose to design your divisions is very much a matter of preference. You can do a little bit of role play. Uh, you don't need to have everything absolutely perfect in order to, you know, be fairly successful in the game. I'll look very quickly at this uh, production interface here. One thing to note is if you want to design an entire division, you go into the division builder here and you would do something like this. Uh, you can also build individual brigades, uh, individual brigades to attach to your existing divisions uh, or to just kind of build divisions from scratch. And both both of those are good ways to uh, both of those are, are 
are good good things to know and good things to practice. So, for example, even in this 1944 start, these a lot of these start dates, uh, these divisions don't have any support brigades, which is really weird. Um, part of the reason why I wouldn't recommend playing this scenario. In 1936, you're at peace, and a lot of what you're going to be doing is is filling out filling out your existing divisions rather than building new ones. So uh, let's take a look, though, at the different brigades uh, and sort of some of the basic. Uh, basic concepts behind division uh, composition in uh, division design in Hearts of Iron 3. So first of all, one of the things that you need to understand good and early is that there are different types of brigades. Uh, there are infantry brigades, there are armor brigades, there are artillery brigades, direct fire and support brigades. And these last three, these last three types of brigades um, are what, what you call support brigades globally in the sense that they fight from the back row in combat. They do not occupy frontage. We'll be talking about frontage later when we get into land combat strategy. They don't talk, they, they, they aren't right at the front, they're behind the lines. They typically don't, they often don't take as much damage. Uh, and they're there. They're there to boost the statistics of, of the of the division and to and 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 give various bonuses. And they're they're very important. Uh, it's very important to understand the interaction. Uh, you'll also notice that there's a percentage value beside these four categories. Well, the, first of all, the categories are color coded, and you'll see that there's actually a couple a couple here that are gray. And we'll talk about militia and military police, for example. We'll talk about those later. Uh, but you know, for now, we're just going to focus on these five different colors. The sort of brown infantry color, uh, the purple armor color, uh, the red is for uh, artillery, the blue is for direct fire, and the green is for support divisions. And I, I see here that the United States does not have every single type of, of, of brigade. I, I said divisions there, I meant brigades. Every single type of brigade uh, available, but we will be jumping back and forth between different countries to, to demonstrate. So... Um, uh, the other thing that I should we should talk about right away is that the there's two things that you're going to take into well there's a number of things that you're going to take into consideration um, when you're designing a division um, you know so I would say one thing would be the unit statistics it's uh, it's the division statistics it's it's uh, strengths and weaknesses and we can see the various statistics here I'm going to go through them quickly soon uh, another thing would be uh, the cost of the unit both in terms of the industrial capacity it takes and the building the time that it takes to build uh, the units the manpower cost of the unit the officer cost of the unit which is often overlooked and very important uh, the fuel costs and the supply costs. So uh, we talked a lot about resources last episode and familiarizing yourself with the resources that are available to your country. Uh, it's going to be important for you to have a sense of those resources when you make decisions about what kind of divisions you're going to build. And different countries with different strengths and weaknesses in terms of their resources uh, will want to focus more on different types of uh, more cost-effective types of divisions. Um, and another aspect that you're going to look at in terms of division design is combined arms and how does combined arms work well for to get basically by mixing the more different types of units that you mix the more combined arms that you get so in order to get any combined arms bonus uh, you need to have a t an infantry brigade uh, at least one infantry brigade and there are a few different types of infantry brigades there's uh, cavalry uh, I guess, sorry, yeah, cavalry counts as an infantry brigade, infantry, uh, marines, paratroopers, uh, rangers are the United States special unit, we'll talk more about that after, motorized or mechanized. Uh, now, to get the, com the full combined arms bonus, you would need one type of each, one, sorry, one brigade of each type, and that would be, let's say, for example, with armor, that might be armor, motorized, uh, self-propelled artillery, tank destroyer, and armored car. And, you know, we'll talk about whether or not this is a good good division uh, later. But that would give you the maximum bonus. However, sometimes, uh, sometimes this 20% uh, combined arms bonus, which is basically a flat bonus when they're in combat. Uh, we'll talk more about combined arms when we look at combat. Sometimes that this 
you know, it's not worth it to get this combined arms bonus. Sometimes that the unit statistics that come out of, of, a, of a division with five different types of brigades like this are actually not worth the bonus that you get, and you may want to actually, you know, put two motorized or two SP artillery or two armor or, you know, and we'll talk about different options in terms of all that, but it's a trade-off. So you've got a few different trade-offs. You've got the overall power of the, of the units and their statistics. You've got... Um, the cost of uh, the cost of the uh, units uh, in terms of supplies and officers and IC and manpower and build time, uh, and you've got the combined arms bonus. Uh, just to get back very briefly to militia and military police, which don't fit into this color scheme here, militia do not give you combined arms. You can see that it doesn't highlight the infantry. So adding artillery to militia does not give you a combined arms bonus. So that's uh, that's something that's important to uh, recognize as well. So let's try. Let's start by looking at uh, land unit statistics, and what we're going to do to look at that is we're going to look at all of these here. And this is showing you the statistics for for the various brigades, and they're sortable. So strength, strength indicates uh, well, it essentially indicates how much um, manpower is in the in the brigade at all times. You can see that the actual manpower cost of certain brigades is actually higher than their strength. So we'll look at that separately. This is manpower. Hover over these, by the way. The, the, you'll, you will get used to these little icons, but if you haven't memorized them all, uh, you, you will... Um, if you haven't memorized them all, uh, you, you know, you'll get familiar with them over time. So strength is is uh, literally how much manpower is is needed to reinforce the brigade and to have it at full strength. And all of the frontline divisions are 3,000, and all of the support divisions are 1,000. 1K, 3K. Uh, organization. Uh, organization is a very important statistic, and we're going to get a little bit into, I think we can't avoid getting into a little bit of land combat uh, uh, here. Organization, um, if we look at a unit here, let's grab this unit. So strength, by the way, is that is the orange bar on the left, and uh, as if your unit takes casualties, either from attrition or combat, or if they are, this is a reserve brigade, but because America's at war, the reserve is, is mobilized. If they were a reserve in peacetime, this strength bar would be maybe cut in half or down to a third, depending on the mobilization laws. Uh, so strength is, you know, when you take casualties, this number here and this bar here will go down. And when we hover over it, we see that their strength, 22999 out of 3,000. Uh, organization is the green bar. Uh, so organization is not like casualties, but organization is actually probably more important than strength, or at least as important as strength. Uh, and uh, organization is uh, essentially what allows the unit to stay in combat. Uh, as, as, as the combat... Uh, as the combat progresses, as a battle progresses, units lose organization depending on how well they're performing in the battle. And if this line is completely depleted, a unit will flee, and you'll lose control of the unit. They're completely disorganized. They're fleeing, uh, and and they 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 can no longer fight. And organization is very a very very important uh, st statistic. So, uh, and so if we go back to uh, if we go back to, sorry, our division builder here, we can see that uh, some of the special forces units, the marines, paratroopers, and these rangers are, are very high organization units, and they're, they're kind of elite units. Uh, most of these other units, uh, most of these, a lot of these support units, and these statistics, by the way, will change based on your technology, so not every country is going to look this way, and, and even if you start from the 1936, uh, from the 1936 uh, start, you, you may not have... Uh, the same statistics here, so you you'll, you just have to look at it uh, yourself. Uh, but I can talk about uh, some of the units that have higher and lower organization in general. Uh, combat width. Uh, when you when you when you take a if there was a unit here, for example, when you take a unit and you attack into a, a province, if this was an enemy province, uh, you there is a limit of Essentially, 12 brigades that are sorry, 10 brigades is 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 supposed to be the rule in terms of how many brigades can frontline brigades, so not support brigades. How many brigades can engage in a battle? And if you exceed the number of brigades, you get a penalty. There are ways you can offset that penalty, and I'll talk about those. 
uh, and I'll talk about those. So, uh, different, uh, different um, brigades, armor, armor brigades typically have two combat width. Uh, these, your standard frontline brigades have one combat width, and your support brigades have zero combat width. So one of the things that's very powerful about support brigades is that they add they add to the power and they add to the to the strength and the uh, statistics of a division uh, without adding to the combat width. So they you you know they want they allow you to 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 have some firepower uh, in the battle that doesn't contribute towards the combat width. And if you if you exceed the combat width, you get a cooperation penalty or a stacking penalty. Which is, you know, which can, can, can end up being a pretty nasty penalty. Um, so that's something to keep in mind in terms of your division design. Uh, soft attack. Uh, there's two types of units in this game. There are soft units and hard units. So we'll actually skip over to the softness statistic here. Uh, it's very important. In earlier versions of the game, softness was dealt with differently. So if you've heard things about... Uh, you know the ideal softness for combined arms or something like that. That's done with. The, we don't we don't use that anymore. It's not a thing in uh, in Hearts of Iron 3 anymore. That was an earlier rendition of the game. Uh, units have varying degrees of softness. Soft. Think of softness as as your you know the kind of human element, uh, skin and bones element of your army, and hardness as the armored element of your army. So we can see that armor is 15% soft, where you know infantry is 100% soft. Motorized infantry, for example, is 65% soft. And the higher per the percentage of the softness of the division, the more likely that uh, the, the opposing unit that's attacking it is going to be attacking it with soft attack. Uh, I might be skirting over some of the fine details of, of combat. I know there's combat phases and all of that. You don't really need to understand a, every single tiny mathematical calculation that's happening in combat. So I'm trying to give you the general idea. Based Basically, uh, one simple way of putting it is, the more soft attack a brigade has, the more damage it's going to do to soft targets. Okay, Heart attack here with this bazooka symbol uh, is, is the ability for a, a brigade to, to do damage to hard targets. Okay? Um, piercing attack is a very important mechanic that was introduced, I believe, in one of the DLCs. Uh, and basically, there is an arms race between armor and armor piercing. So, armor, the armor anti-tank units, anti-tank and tank destroyer, for example, have piercing values that are generally higher than the armor values for armor and light armor. But if we get into heavy armor, uh, heavy armor would have armor that these that these units can't necessarily pierce. If the piercing value of your division is lower than the piercing value of the opposing division, you get a, a massive penalty. So uh, basically, even a very, very well-trained, uh, well-led infantry division may not be able to, to, to push through an armored division uh, if they don't have uh, piercing elements and even if they do if the armor is you know if it's heavy enough armor they they won't be able to get through or they will take severe losses fighting through armor so you know sometimes one armored division can hold off three infantry divisions sometimes right uh, piercing armor armor is the reverse statistic right so we can see that armor some of these units uh, mostly just tank destroyers armor cars light armor and armor provide armor um, and obviously the the we can't see we can only see what America can build here so there's no heavier super heavy armor toughness uh, sorry defensiveness uh, defensiveness is basically determines I mean, you know, a simple way of putting it is it determines how good a unit is at defending, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. It 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 determines how how likely the unit is to take losses while while defending. Okay, and offensiveness and toughness. Sorry, not offensiveness. Toughness <laughs> toughness determines uh, how likely a unit is to take losses while on the on the offense. Okay, air defense is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, one thing to note about air defense in um, in uh, in Hearts of Iron Three is air defense does not 
uh, it doesn't prevent your units from taking damage from planes. It damages the org, the organization, and the strength of the planes, and is and so it indirectly prevents your units from getting killed by bombers, for example, because they will break off from combat sooner if they if they are damaged by the units they're attacking. So air air defense is uh, is certainly uh, is, you know a worthwhile statistic to keep in mind. We already talked about softness. Uh, finally, uh, there's for this unit statistics. Oh, sorry, no, there's one more. Uh, there's speed, and speed is an important statistic to keep in mind when you're designing divisions because a division moves as fast as its slowest brigade. So if we put a light armor that moves at 10 kilometers per hour uh, in in uh, in a in a division with a tank destroyer that moves at eight kilometers an hour, the speed of the division is only going to be eight eight kilometers an hour. Uh, so so you can only move as slow as the slowest brigade. Sometimes I've seen people say that speed is an average of brigades. I believe that was true in a past version of this game. It's not. Uh, speed sp you move at you move at the speed of the. Uh, slowest unit in the division. So mixing slower units like, say, artillery that isn't uh, self-propelled artillery into armor divisions is, is not not a particularly, not necessarily a good strategy. Uh, there could be instances where it would be. Uh, the final statistic on this bar, before we get to costs and also terrain, uh, which I need to discuss as well, uh, the final statist statistic on this bar here is suppression. Suppression is used to suppress uh, partisans, which are the rebels that you have in Hearts of Iron 3. So let's quickly open up the revolt risk map mode. We can see that the allies are occupying southern Italy, so we, can, we have a revolt risk. Um, we can see that by having units up here, some of these units are probably giving a little bit of suppression. Let's see, do we get any... I don't know what would be causing the suppression there. Maybe just having units gives a, a base. No, infantry gives a basic suppression, and you know, so you get like a very basic level of suppression, and then you have brigades. The military police is a support brigade. It does not take up combat with. It's something you attach to units to uh, to basically prevent partisans from spawning. And you can see that uh, garrisons also have a little bit of a boost to suppression. So that's that statistic. Um, I think we also have to look at terrain before we start talking about division composition because uh, different units have different terrain bonuses. So let's quickly look. This is the basic terrain map, uh, which is uh, not the easiest to read. It's a little bit hard to tell what's going on in this terrain map. Let's look over at Italy here. So we can sort of see that there's mountains and stuff, but it doesn't give us very much detail. Simplified terrain is better. So uh, this here we can see mountains, we can see hills, uh, forest, woods, urban, uh, deserts, plains, uh, Arctic, uh, jungle, uh, marsh. That's I think I've pretty much covered them all off there. Uh, hills, mountains, forest, you know, uh, and uh, so if you want to see what uh, what the terrain bonuses and penalties of a brigade are, put one in your division builder here and hover over this. Okay, so most almost all brigades have a uh, have negative modifiers for attacking into any kind of rough terrain. They also have modifiers, oh I forgot about forts, provinces that have forts in it. Let me show you the fort symbol on a province. Uh, we can see that easily on the terrain mode. So forts also give a, an, a, a, a penalty to attackers. Back in the division designer here. Uh, amphibious attack uh, also gives a penalty to attackers. Uh, generally for almost all brigade types and those penalties are, are of differing severity for differing brigades so generally uh, motorized brigades uh, where is this motorized brigades for example tend to have worse penalties than uh, infantry brigades for, for terrain infantry tends to be a little bit less motorized and armored anything anything that's fast and mo and and kind of motorized uh, tends to have uh, nastier terrain penalties. So see mountain, for basic infantry you get a minus 
percent penalty, which is a pretty pretty big ass penalty uh, for infantry. But if we put in a tank destroyer, uh, right away we're at minus ninety, and we also lose. We also it also we also get a defense penalty and a movement penalty. So uh, and and when I talked about the speed of a division, sometimes there are units that speed up divisions. They don't speed up divisions because of their max speed. They speed up divisions because they lessen the terrain penalty. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, let's now talk about the cost of units. So first of all, supply consumption. Uh, keep in mind that supplies and fuel are separate. We talked about supplies and fuels last episode. So uh, obviously, uh, the more generally speaking, the more expensive units tend to cost more in terms of supplies. So armor not only costs uh, the, the most in terms of fuel, it also costs the most in terms of supplies, mechanized, anti-tank artillery, uh, looks like they cost, oh no, everything, everything else, all of these standard divisions here, uh, these support divisions, as well as marines and special forces, uh, no, marines and special forces cost a bit more than infantry, but yeah, you need to, be, you need to sort this and take a look at it, and then this will change over time. Uh, generally, as you as you improve units, sometimes they'll cost more supplies, or they'll cost more in terms of fuel. So, so yeah, something to keep in mind. Um, one of the reasons, so militia, like I said, doesn't give you a a combined arms bonus. It doesn't allow you to have a combined arms bonus, and it's a very weak unit overall. However, it also consumes very few supplies. Okay, uh, in terms of fuel, anything that's motorized consumes fuel. So artillery does not consume fuel, but self-propelled artillery does consume fuel. So countries that have a uh, severe restrictions on the amount of fuel uh, that they're able to get easily, uh, like Japan and Italy and to a lesser degree Germany, uh, need to think about whether it's a good idea to have an entirely motor motorized army. So for example, Germany may wish to basically conserve its fuel for its air force and its armored divisions and only use uh, only use uh, infantry on foot when the standard infantry division is an infantry is is like a this is like a column of infantry that would that moves around by by walking essentially on foot and that's why they only move at where is it four kilometers per hour Right, whereas your light armor or your mechanized division would move at 10 kilometers an hour. Right, so uh, that's that covers off supply and fuel consumption. Officers. Officers are very, very important. Uh, as we talked about in the last episode, they're important because you need to take leadership away from your research budget or your espionage budget, but most importantly you're going to be taking leadership away from research and putting it into officers. And if you are a country that does not have a huge amount of leadership, especially at the beginning of the game like Italy or Japan or uh, the Soviet Union or um, who else? France. Uh, you know, if you're one of those countries that has a little bit less um, leadership, or even say ch uh, nationalist China, then you're not you're going to want to pr probably, if, you know, if you can help it, avoid building units that suck up a lot of, of leadership, uh, and the and, and of officers, sorry, and and so officers. Um, Officers, uh, it's the special forces take more officers. These are, take more commissioned officers. The kind of more specialized units. Uh, other than that, the mostly mostly all the different brigade types are the same. Uh, military police, garrisons, and militia take up less officers. So so you know that's an interesting thing to remember. And sometimes the, the militia and garrisons are not very powerful units, for example, but they do have their uses, and uh, they are very inexpensive. They take very few supplies. They don't. Take any fuel and they take very few officers um, yeah another thing to keep in mind about officers is that if you're playing as say the Soviet Union the temptation might be to just build you know a hundred divisions right at the start of the game well if you're the more the bigger an army you build the less 
high tech that army is going to be because the more of your leadership you're going to have to put into officers to to keep your officer ratio at 140 percent which it should be at all times or as much as you possibly can uh, there's almost never a circumstance where it's more important to you know to get that next tech than it is to increase your keep your officer ratio uh, uh, where you know where it needs to be so you know building very very large armies when you don't have a lot of leadership is difficult and and you're going to have to uh, limit your research in order to do so, and you're going to have to focus on specific unit types. So when you're thinking about, you know, special forces for the Soviet Union may not be that great an idea, even though it'd be really cool. We don't have mountain, uh, we don't have mountain uh, units as America, which is kind of insane. Um, I'm kind of regretting loading America because they have such a shitty array of uh, units available. Well, not shitty, but they have, you know, uh, they're missing some. We'll we'll flip over to uh, to to Germany and the Soviet Union after to take a look at the take a look at them um, but uh, yeah so very important to keep in mind the, the officers here next uh, next uh, thing we want to look at is uh, IC obviously the you know the more expensive units armor mechanized anything that's motorized or mechanized uh, takes up more IC to build uh, also takes more IC days so th these two things kind of work in tandem right you've got build I build cost and IC and build time so armor not only does armor take you know use up 9.86 uh, industrial capacity it also takes up more time it takes more time to build uh, although I can see here that Rangers actually take you know so basically the cost of a unit is going to be found by multiplying these two numbers. So it's 9.86 IC times 148 days. And there are a few there are a few tables on the wiki uh, that uh, if you look at uh, land unit statistics, some of them I think are a little bit out of date, especially the ones on terrain are a little bit out of date. But if you want to see what the most cost effective units are, you can look at those tables. And I think eh, some of it's still true. So you're, you are going to have to experiment and look at these statistics a bit. Uh, mostly, as I've said several times, you know, don't worry about getting the absolute most bang for your buck out of every single division. It's not necessary unless you're playing on very hard, at which point, you know, you should just experiment and see, uh, see, you know, once you understand what these statistics mean, you, you should be able to experiment and look at what the technologies improve and, and yeah. So here we go. A uh, manpower again. Manpower is basically similar to uh, officers in the sense that uh, it takes four manpower uh, for f to to build the Marines. Uh, it takes a little bit less for armor and it looks like it takes less manpower for armor than it does for infantry yeah so you know keep this in mind as well uh, at the end of the day uh, this is I think what's taken out of your pool right when you put it in the production queue at the end of the day though what's gonna matter in the long run is a little bit is probably strength more than anything because to replenish the strength you uh, you, you're you're going to be drawing on your manpower pool, but it's a, it's, a, it's a reasonable thing to pay attention to here. How much manpower a a, a unit uses up, and also something to pay attention to uh, when you're looking at ships and planes, which we'll get to, because it's easy to forget that ships and planes also use manpower, uh, not as much as as these land units, but uh, but they do use it. Right, that covers all of these costs. We've talked about uh, terrain, and we've talked about uh, these statistics here. When you put when you put brigades in a division, uh, basically most of these statistics are simply summed. Right, so I'm I'm not going to be using the fifth brigade a lot because we're going to be talking about uh, how to do your builds in 1936. But eventually, you'd be able to add perhaps an anti-tank. Or maybe a, maybe a, an anti-aircraft to to an infantry division, but you can see here the sum of all of the strength is is eleven thousand. The combat width is three because each one of these infantry has a combat width of one. Uh, the uh, you know the heart attack is fourteen. Uh, if we were to put two anti-tanks, the heart attack would go up to uh, where is it twenty. Okay, uh, the soft attack, uh, where are we here? Let's, let's go this way. Oh yeah, organization, we've also got a sum of the organization. The uh, soft attack is 22. Uh, with this with this division here, the hard attack is 14. The uh, piercing, and if we were to replace the artillery with, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, another anti-tank, our soft attack would, uh, I think, go down. Looks like 17. 22, yeah. Uh, def 
where is it, piercing attack. Uh, if we take out the anti-tank and we put another artillery, we lose piercing attack. So this this division won't be as good at uh, at uh, fighting fighting armored units. Um, air attack as well. Obviously, if we put in a an anti-aircraft, we'll get a big boost to uh, air. Sorry, not air attack, air defense. Um, right, that's a pretty. We're almost doubling the uh, air defense. Yeah. So if we put two artillery, we get nine. If we put one artillery, one anti-aircraft, we put fourteen. We get fourteen. Softness. Uh, softness is going to determine whether the enemy's hard attack or the soft attack is going to be used to attack you. So, a very soft unit will be vulnerable to. A very soft unit will be will be more vulnerable to uh, artillery and units with uh, so, with with high soft attack. Uh, a very hard unit will be more vulnerable to units with uh, a, a high hard attack. More or less, uh, it's a lot to keep in your head, but don't uh, don't fret too much about it. I'm going to give you some concrete examples of uh, division types to build uh, very very soon. Uh, the speed, on the other hand, is not a sum and it's not an average. It is simply the lowest speed here. So let's do another example. Uh, take light armor. Light armor is a very fast unit. Let's say that we could put, if we wanted to build the, to have the unit be. Uh, uh, be able to move it consistently at 10 kilometers per hour, we could put a mechanized unit. But you know, mechanized units are very expensive in terms of IC, so maybe we'll put a motorized unit. Well, speed's gone down to 8.5, right? So there are trade offs. There are trade offs. Now, if we put an armored unit, the speed's down to 8 because motorized units actually move faster than armored units. Okay? So there we go, uh, and then suppression, supply consumption, fuel consumption, etc. That's just going to be a, th these ones are just going to be a sum of the of the values. Um, so let's uh, let's look at some standard uh, division composition types. Uh, so one thing I want to point out is that you know uh, soft attack and hard attack uh, organization are are probably the most important statistics in certain senses. Some of the most important statistics, anyway. Piercing attack as well, obviously. They're they're all they're all very important. But the statistic that gives your unit the most strength is ultimately strength. Uh, and so now that doesn't mean that this division is the best division. Um, but generally speaking, uh, if you wanted to, for example, if you're using infantry and you don't want to make an armored unit, but you want to get the biggest benefits uh, of combined arms, that something like mm, this is not necessarily a better division than, uh, you know, having three front line, where is it? Uh, where is my infantry? There we go. Three front line um, divisions, on, only two so support divisions. Uh, the extra 5% combined arms bonus is, is generally speaking, not better than having an extra infantry unit. There are circumstances, though. Uh, there are circumstances where a design like this could be a good one. Uh, one example would be if you simply do not have a lot of manpower. Uh, if your country does not have a lot of manpower, you want to field more divisions so that you can cover more grounds, uh, and so perhaps you know having less uh, less of these 3,000k uh, units in your division will be uh, will be advantageous. Uh, so so that's you know something to keep in mind. There's some trade-offs to be made there. Most people tend to agree that the three brigades three standard infantry brigades plus one to two support brigades is kind of the ideal infantry division. So which support brigade should we pick though? Uh, there are, uh, so, you know, we, we can put, uh, we don't have engineers because we're playing the US right now, which is kind of silly. Uh, maybe I'll switch. Let's, uh, let's just see if I can tag switch the Soviet Union. Maybe they have engineers. So uh, infantry. So, you know, like I said, you can either do a two brigade infantry division or a three brigade infantry division. Um, if you are doing a three brigade infantry division, so you only, until you unlock a law, the law that allows you, you, see, we don't even have superior firepower, which is the, the, not the law, the technology that allows you to add the fifth brigade. Uh, so this is actually a good example for starting out. I only have one choice of support br brigade. Well, what choice do I pick? Uh, generally speaking, the artillery, which has the highest soft attack, is going to be your best choice. And that is because 
uh, the vast majority of the targets in the game are soft. Most armies will will be about maybe have a ratio of about three infantry or soft units to one hard unit uh, or armored unit. So even though we're not getting the piercing attack from from a from an anti tank unit, even though we're not getting the hard attack from an anti tank unit, artillery's going to be better in it three times out of four. Now, obviously, this unit will not, will will struggle against an armored unit, uh, but uh, it's probably still uh, still worthwhile. Uh, keep in mind that uh, you know every one of these brigades has different technologies that are, and we'll look more at those later. But every every one of these brigades has different technologies that uh, that uh, you know increase its statistics so the more types of brigades you use the more t the more technologies you need to research uh, the more leadership you need to have available for research you may not be able to build as big an army because you may not be able to recruit enough officers to keep your officer ratio up, uh, up high enough to have your army fight effectively so all sorts of trade-offs, but this is a very good, this is probably the most uh, universally used uh, division composition in Hearts of Iron 3. Um, if we, uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned, uh, there's, uh, you know, other, uh, there's, there are other situations where you might do something like this as well. Um, so that's, uh, you know, worth keeping in mind. Uh, there are other people who might suggest that you in increase the number of, you put two or three artillery d uh, d brigades if you have uh, the extra brigade, maybe three infantry and two artillery, simply because they estimate that the, the soft attack of the artillery is worth more than the 5% five uh, combined arms bonus, and that may be true. Uh, I'm not going to argue, though. I'm not here. I'm just, I'm really not interested in, in, uh, in telling you guys and in, in saying, oh, no, anti-tank is always better than artillery, or artillery is always better than, no, it's just, it's, it's pointless, uh, right? So the, the difference is, is, is substantial, but uh, it's something you can play around with. Uh, if you want to do something where you kind of mix and match and use different support brigades and different divisions, then uh, just go for it. Uh, you'll probably have a, a balanced uh, a balanced army overall, and, and like I said, the, uh, the AI's division design is not particularly good, so you'll likely be facing off against divisions that are not very well designed. Now, what are some of the weaknesses of the standard infantry division? Well, uh, let's look uh, here in terrain. So, Infantry has a penalty, as we saw before. Infantry has a penalty. These are averages, by the way. Uh, these are these are averages. Uh, every um, so every individual brigade has its own stati train statistics, and they they are averaged. Uh, so you know, by adding the artillery, uh, we we add uh, you know one quarter of the artillery's penalties or advantages here. So uh, the, we can see that infantry has a, a mountain, a, 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 you know, the pretty standard batch of penalties to all these rough terrains, forts, uh, and amphibious. Um, and uh, the, there's a couple of technologies. I think Arctic warfare equipment and, and mountain warfare equipment are giving are giving that uh, attrition bonus. Um, as soon as we add the artillery, what happens? Well, the attack penalty has gone up by 5%, and we've added a 17.5% movement penalty. So uh, the, one of the areas where you might want to consider not using artillery is when you're fighting in, in uh, rough terrain. When you're fighting in rough terrain, for example, in uh, when I play as the British, I often don't put artillery in my infantry divisions in the Asian uh, theater. Or if I'm playing as Japan, I, I may des design divisions that do not have uh, artillery in them because the ter the movement penalty is can be kind of harsh. The attack penalty, though, is pretty mild and overall still a very strong division. Uh, Anti-tank has looks like the same penalties, right? Um, what can we do to mitigate terrain penalties? Well, for infantry, for slow-moving units that are on foot, engineers. That's what that's what the support brigades, both of them, armored cars and engineers, both offer different terrain advantages. Um, but they are that's their main purpose is offering a terrain advantage, and they they off they also offer a few uh, a few minor uh, a few other minor 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 things that bolster bolster units. 
So engineers, uh, engineers, you can see actually give a defensive bonus. Engineers are essentially a defensive unit. They give a defensive bonus in almost all terrain. Um, they give a bonus to attacking forts, so they're good for you can make these kind of fort busting divisions when you're attacking forts, uh, and they give movement bonuses as well. Um, they're good at crossing rivers. They're good at uh, defending rivers, uh, defending. Um, the, and defending uh, cities, uh, defending you know pretty much pretty much everywhere except it looks like woods and forest they don't get an advantage, but yeah and there's there's a couple of st um, statistics that you, there's a couple of um, techs that you can do to increase these bonuses. Uh, engineers, however, are not very good combat uh, per combat brigades. Let's take a look at their stats. Uh, they only have one. This is the Soviet Union, so keep in mind that the Soviet Union might be behind in technology in some areas. They have one air, uh, like you know, one heart attack, uh, three defensiveness, uh, air defense, uh, air attack, zero. Like they, they're fairly soft units. They're ninety percent soft, and they they don't have. They have very poor combat stats, so they can be used if we're against. We're playing as the Soviets here, so we don't have the fifth uh, brigade technology but if we if we add them on as the fifth brigade I think that, that that's actually a division design that I like very much three infantry one artillery and and uh, one engineer and the the engineer basically makes the unit a little bit better on the defense and it uh, it um, mitigates the it mitigates some of the terrain movement penalties uh, and and so that's an interesting d uh, division design some people will tell you that they never use engineers some people will tell you that they never use engineers, they never use armored cars, uh, and uh, the, often it's because they just don't like, they just don't think they're good enough in combat. Engineers also move faster than infantry, so engineers actually move at the same speed as armor, as standard armor. So you see, we still get the eight kilometers per hour there. I don't know what if Germany has everything available, but uh, I'm gonna assume. Oh look, they've got rocket artillery. Great. Okay, I thought the Soviets would, to be honest. I I just I never play this this 1944 scenario. It looks like Germany is going to be our best bet to show you guys all this stuff. Let's take a look at the terrain penalty here. Movement minus 12.5 in mountains. Let's go back to regular artillery. Movement minus 17.5 in mountains. Let's look at the supply consumption. 3.01, 3.51. One. Yeah. So a little bit. They, they consume a little bit more supplies. But they uh, they are going to move a little bit faster in rougher terrain. I think they. What about their attack penalty? Fifty-three point seven. Fifty-five. So they also get less of an attack penalty for some of these rough terrains. Okay. Um, so rocket artillery, artillery. It's an interesting option. The thing about rocket artillery is it's not unlocked until uh, 1939. So, you know, you may start building all your divisions with artillery, and this is what happens a lot, I think, to a lot of players. Rocket artillery is an interesting option, but you, you start building, like, filling out all your divisions with artillery, and then you, t you have to start researching rocket artillery techs if you want to switch over to rocket artillery, and it's just, you've already invested so much in artillery, and you've invested in those techs that that it, it doesn't really quite make sense. It, it might make sense for the Soviet Union because they, they don't need to be at war until about 1941, so you can just hold off and building building your artillery until you've unlocked rocket artillery. Uh, I think uh, I think it costs less to produce too. Let me double check that. Oh, uh, where is it here? Regular artillery, 10.65 for 106 days. 9.16 for 105 days. So it costs slightly less. So interesting comparison there between rocket artillery and artillery. Uh, motorized, so if you want a faster moving uh, infantry unit, you're going to use motorized and you're going to use probably self-propelled artillery. Probably self-propelled artillery is uh, is going to be your unit of choice. Uh, it's a little bit of an expensive unit. Uh, you might want to consider uh, if, well, no, it looks like it's... Yeah, so if you're if you're really IC poor, if you're playing a country that doesn't have a lot of IC, you might want to consider, say, an armored car. Uh, armored car is not a very very similar to our to engineers. Not a, not a particularly good uh, combat division, uh, but it does give a small armor boost. Uh, it does not nearly as much as light armor, but it gives a small armor armor boost, which means that infantry divisions that don't have um, infantry divisions that don't have a 
an armor piercing value or an artillery brigade uh, will have a hard time attacking it. Armored cars could be useful, especially for countries that are going to be facing off against opponents that don't have a lot of armor. It can give you a bit of a boost, a boost by, by you know, because they're not going to have the piercing to, they're going to get the, the penalty when they attack you. Uh, so that might be a cheaper uh, division. Uh, you know, if you're really piss poor and you, you must build a motorized division, you could consider putting, uh, where is it, motorized AA. Motorized AA is a fairly reasonably cheap uh, motorized support brigade. It's going to give you a little bit of combined arms. Uh, it does have a little bit of hard attack, uh, soft attack, because uh, motorized anti-aircraft uh, was used by the Germans in, in lieu of anti-tank guns. Uh, anti-aircraft guns were were turned into uh, uh, anti anti tank guns, and so there's a little bit of a hard attack, I think, and uh, and soft attack bonus that you get from motorized AA. This is a cheap motorized division. Obviously, the same goes if you do have the fifth brigade unlocked. Uh, you could do a combination like uh, oops. There's also, by the way, there's also self-propelled rocket artillery. It looks like Germany has not unlocked it, but there is there is such a thing as self-propelled rocket artillery that moves faster, and, and the comparison between the two is fairly similar. Um, one other thing is that self-propelled rocket artillery uh, requires you to do a full round of light light tank brigade and to unlock a tech. So if you're primarily using medium tanks or even heavy tanks, Unlocking uh, self-propelled artillery is is a whole. It's five techs basically, um, past what you would normally need to be just working with medium armor. So, you may end up uh, if you are going to use motorized divisions, you may end up using armored cars. I quite like armored cars personally. Um, armored cars are an interesting unit. So uh, they they have different terrain bonuses than engineers. They're, they, they are not good at the things that engineers are good at, so urban defense, uh, you know, fort attack, uh, <coughs> uh, woods, uh, river crossing, they don't have bonuses to that. However, they are good at open terrain. Uh, they are, oh, it looks like they do have an urban movement bonus. Interesting, I didn't know that. Okay, well, you know, you got to look at these. You got to look at these. It's hard to keep them all memorized in your head, right? Uh, but basically, where armored cars really shine is in these open plains. Uh, and so, if you are if you are using motorized infantry, and motorized infantry is typically used a lot by the Allies. Germany doesn't tend to use it because it doesn't have enough fuel. Um, if you are using uh, motorized infantry, uh, you'll be able to, you know, move very, very, very quickly along the plains. You can. It's also very good in the desert. So when you're fighting in, uh, when you're fighting in the the desert campaign in North Africa, um, a division like this can be a very good division because they get a a desert movement bonus of 10%, and it's you know you'd be you'd be surprised just how zippy those uh, these units move when they're when they're in the desert. They they're, they're very cool. So that's a good brigade design. That's a good division design. Sorry. Um, you know, if you want a, mo a very cheap mobile division, you can also look at a cavalry division. Uh, cavalry divisions are not something you would typically build as a modern country, as a country with decent leadership and research. Uh, there are a few countries that are not able. There are many countries that are not able to field motorized divisions at the beginning. Uh, you have to do a few rounds of. Uh, this cavalry research to unlock motorized infantry. Most of the major, almost all the major countries, I, I think, uh, maybe ex with the exception of China, are able to build motorized divisions from the start. Cavalry has the advantage; it's not nearly as fast as it's not nearly as fast as a motorized infantry, but it is much cheaper in terms of IC. It does not consume any fuel. It does consume a fair amount of supplies, though. Uh, cavalry does give you access to the uh, infantry to the combined arms bonus, so we can put cavalry. We could put let's I don't know maybe we do a combination of cavalry and SP artillery or something. And it's a bit of a funny, funny division design, but uh, you never know. Could could be uh, could be okay. Um, its movement penalties are a little bit less harsh, I believe, than. Um, motorized divisions, so there are situations where it might be useful. Uh, cavalry is particularly good for hunting partisans. When you're when rebels spawn, where's the 
Revolt Risk map. When you have rebels spawning way uh, way back, and you know you got rebels spawning here, well, rather than having your frontline infantry divisions, uh, <laughs> these are shitty divisions anyway. Rather than having your frontline infantry divisions um, set up in uh, in you know in an area like Greece that's very far from the front, uh, you you might want to have some just one or two cavalry units here so that they can quickly you know run around and dispatch. Um, Dispatch partisans. So there's a there's another example of a division a division design. Typically, though, if you're using cavalry for that purpose, uh, that would be one instance where uh, one instance where you might just put one or two brigades because there's just simply no point in using a bunch of manpower for a division that's not going to be fighting on the front lines. Hot mechanized divisions are are like infantry on a half track. You know, motorized would be infantry uh, with truck transports moving them around quickly. Mechanized would be on like a half track, and those mechanized units who are going to move, they're going to move very very quickly. They're also going to be a little bit more armored so that they can they have some heart attack. Um, they are a less, they are a harder, less soft unit. So, uh, you know, artillery is not going to damage them as much, uh, and so they they're a very powerful unit. They're a very very expensive unit. They consume a lot of fuel. They it, it costs a lot of IC to build them. Very rare that you're going to see people using a, a huge number of mechanized divisions. Um, perhaps the United States, is, uh, maybe Britain and the United States are the only countries that can really afford to to build these um, in any in any quantity. Germany might build a few, but you would use them very selectively. Um, they also have uh, a lot of terrain penalties, similar to similar to um, motorized divisions. They have a lot of terrain terrain penalties, so so they're you know they're best they're best used on those open plains. Uh, if you want to have a very very fast uh, fast division. Uh, one one instance where it might be worth using a mechanized uh, brigade, I would I would actually shy away from building an infantry division like this, for example. First of all, the SP artillery is actually slowing down the mechanized uh, divisions anyway, and it's just it's just a very it's a very costly unit. Certainly, that heart attack is not bad, um, but that's a very costly unit to to build. Um, of course, you could also put a tank destroyer in there, but then you're really slowing it down, and y you're 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 losing using a lot of the advantages of a mechanized unit uh, by using it in that. It's, it's actually better used as the infantry brigade in, in a light armor division. Uh, and that division would be used for exploitation and going deep behind enemy lines and uh, moving very quickly and, and also being able to defend itself deep behind enemy lines. Uh, so we'll look at that after when we get to um, armored divisions. Uh, let's take a look at special forces. Special forces. So paratroopers. Uh, para obviously, paratroopers are you know for you know dropping out of um, air transports. They are for dropping behind enemy lines. They are a bit of an exploit unit. You can you can uh, basically defeat any opponent opponent by dropping paratroopers beside their capital. Uh, that's something that most people consider to be kind of cheating. And and I'll show I'll I'll demonstrate that or at least show you how how you would do it later. But um, you know, use at your own discretion. Uh, the AI is not very good at using paratroopers, so if you use them extensively, you can really mess with the AI, cut off their supply lines. But they're very cool, so I tend, I do use them, but I tend to use them in a kind of role play way. I tend to try and avoid exploding them. They're not actually very strong units. They're very, they're very, very expensive units uh, in terms of their IC, but also in terms of their officers. Um, and they don't have the best combat statistics. They're not. They don't have as good combat statistics, generally speaking, as infantry. They do have, I think, a bit more toughness. They have a little bit more toughness, and they have a little bit more org uh, organization, I believe, than your standard infantry division. Of course, that's going to depend on technology. So, well, looks like uh, Germany's infantry actually has more org than its paratroopers. But anyway, there are some advantages. Uh, but they're mainly used. They should really. I would really only use them for. Um, for dropping out of um, air transports, I wouldn't use them on their own. Also, keep in mind that they are the only units, uh, except for Gurkhas, uh, and I think maybe the Italian Alpinis, but I'm not sure. One of the other special, special, unique units can can para drop. Um, they are the only unit that can uh, drop out of air transport planes, so they, they won't have any combined arms. They won't have any artillery. One strategy is to drop them behind enemy lines. 
in a kind of D-Day fashion, drop them behind enemy lines, and then and then use them as regular infantry and and just bring the artillery brigades separately. And that's that's certainly a viable option. Definitely requires a little bit of micromanagement to pull off. But uh, you know, they 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 could be if if you built a lot of them, you would definitely want to be doing that because there are fairly few situations where you're just going to hop around the map with uh, air transport. You know, unless you are just, unless you're being, you know, kind of, a, you're sort of cheating, cheating the AI, basically. Uh, Marines, Marines are pretty self-explanatory, although they have a few features that are often overlooked. So Marines, um, Marines are obviously, uh, they have a, a reduced amphibious uh, attack penalty. They're, they're, they, they're very fast amphibious units. Uh, they, 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 they do naval invasions quicker, and they take less damage doing them. Uh, they also have, I believe, generally they have pretty good organization and uh, toughness and, I believe, defensiveness. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, but they're, they tend to be a little bit weaker than infantry in, in, most, uh, in, in most terrain. They also have bonuses in jungle. Uh, and bonuses, I think, in the desert and also in marshes in particular. They marshes, woods. They, they, they do. They have some some terrain bonuses. So they are they are fairly good elite infantry. Uh, but they're very expensive, right? They have a higher, a much higher officer cost, and that's the real trade-off with paratroopers as well. Very, very high officer cost. Obviously, with paratroopers, you also need to have the hardware to drop them off. So you got to have your transport planes, which are very expensive as well. Marines, you're going to have to have the naval capacity to to, to deliver them to their targets, uh, landing craft, and other expensive toys. Um, so special units can be very powerful. Uh, elite, un sorry, what am I trying to say? Special forces can be very powerful, but uh, they they are expensive and and they require a lot of other texts to research, doctrine texts and specific texts that give them advantages. That um, you know, so countries that have a, a not don't have a lot of leadership are probably going to want to avoid special forces in general. Countries that do have a lot of leadership can you know build all them all they want. Let's go to mountain infantry before I finish talking about marines. Mountain infantry, uh, it's pretty self-evident what terrain it's good in. Uh, but they're called mountain infantry, but you should think of them as your, you know, rough terrain infantry because they are also good in mountains. They are good in, they are faster in forest and woods. Uh, they are good in hills, jungle, uh, arctic. They they are your spe they are re truly your 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 general purpose special forces units. Now, um, I wanted to stop at uh, I wanted to stop uh, I wanted to go back to Marines and everything. Generally speaking, so paratroopers you cannot attach support brigades to unless they're unless you you know you 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 land the support brigades like you would land your artillery afterwards and attach them to paratroopers and that makes sense they just can't drop when they have they can't drop with artillery right uh, mountain units uh, the the whole advantage of mountain units and they they like the other special forces units they cost a lot of officers the whole advantage of them is their terrain bonuses so uh, it's not worthwhile to attach artillery to them. When you attach artillery, you dilute those train bonuses, and they become a lot less interesting units. Uh, when you, you know, even if you attach engineers to them, mountain mountain units actually have better, uh, generally speaking, better uh, bonuses uh, than uh, than what the engineers have to offer, and so they're simply going to, um, you know, dilute those bonuses. So plus ten movement in the mountains. What happens when we add an engineer? plus 7.5 movement in mountains. So it, once again, as I mentioned before, you're actually better off without the combined arms penalty, uh, having more strength and having four brigades or even five brigades in a mountain division than in doing something like attaching an engineer or attaching uh, artillery or anti-aircraft or anything like that. Uh, generally, anti-aircraft does have a little bit less terrain penalties than the anti-tank and uh, and artillery units, but still, it's it's just mountain units are best used on their own, on their own. Three, four, five brigades, depending on how much uh, you know how much leadership you have to give them officers, to, depending because they are officer-hungry units. Um, Marines, on the other hand, uh, it is worthwhile to add engineers to Marines. Uh, not necessarily always worthwhile, but 
this is actually a very good jungle division uh, because both engineers and marines get bonuses to similar types of terrains and they, they will stack so river defense river movements uh, you know jungle movement plus 18.7 you're also getting the 5% combined arms this is a pretty good division is it better than this division I don't know uh, it's really anyone's guess, you know. I think this division might might even be better, but you you know you're getting some attack and defense bonuses from the engineer that, and as well as the combined arm bonus, uh, and the unit's also going to consume a little bit less supplies. Although it does, one thing that people often overlook is that engineers do consume fuel, so you know you do have to be careful about that. Let's look at our uh, armored divisions now. We've been kind of holding off on that. So Germany does have heavy armor available. Uh, generally speaking, heavy armor is very is prohibitively expensive, and, and it's not something you should basically ever be using. It's just too expensive. Uh, it does have the highest armor, and it cannot be pierced by tank destroyers and anti-tank unless those anti-tank are researched well ahead of time, which is a very costly thing to do. Uh, so heavy armor is kind of invincible. Uh, the only way to defeat heavy armor in most cert cases is to surround it and cut it off from supplies and starve it. Uh, but uh, heavy armor, you know, it's so expensive to build. It's 17 IC just for the heavy armor brigade itself. It's so expensive to build that it's uh, that it's not. Uh, you, you, you there aren't that many uses for it. It also requires a whole new set of research in the, in your armor technology tab to open it up. So. I would tend to avoid it. Um, there is an exploitation, uh, there is a, a kind of cheap division you can build where you just do something like this. You build regular infantry, a little bit of artillery, and a heavy armor brigade, and this unit is basically unstoppable. Um, uh, so, you know, but that's not, that's not a very realistic historical division design. It's, uh, you know, it's something that you, that it's, it, I think it's largely considered to be a bit of an exploit. So people will just ha add one heavy armor division to every single, uh, division that they, and every, one heavy armor brigade to every single division that they build and will make that them kind of indestructible. And I, you know, if you want to do that, go ahead. Uh, not, not. It's not the way I play the game. Uh, and I, you know, I don't, I don't consider it cheating necessarily, but it's, it's not something that the AI will ever do. So it will give you a, a kind of a weird uh, advantage. Most of the time, though, most countries just don't even have the IC to even do that. Uh, this is gonna, you know, building five divisions of this will will tie up your IC for, you know, the better part of a year uh, for a lot of countries. Uh, the light armor is the fastest armor. Light armor is the fastest armor, and it, uh, you know, it's it it, it it that is an advantage. It also the heavier the armor is, the more terrain penalties they have. So light armor is a little bit better in uh, in some rougher terrains, uh, and it uses less supplies and it uses less fuel. However, uh, it does not upgrade as well as your research technology. So it does not get good piercing attack. It does not get uh, good armor. It can easily be defeated by uh, anti-tank brigades and things like that later on. Uh, there is an argument for using uh, light armor. Uh, in, in there is an argument for using light armor. Uh, first of all, you would you would use it if you are in uh, certain kinds of rough terrain. Um, one thing I haven't talked about is infrastructure. So you you know you're going to watch out for rough terrain, but you're also going to watch out for low infrastructure because supplies and fuel don't move as quickly along. Um, uh, these these red provinces have uh, have very low infrastructure, so you know this is why German armor gets bogged down here uh, because their supply lines get cut off, especially in this big uh, marshy area here. Uh, their supply lines get cut off, so there is an argument for using light armor, uh, both you know either if you can't afford heavy armor or if uh, if you are going to be in uh, areas that have low infrastructure or that have rougher terrain, but you you want a little bit of an edge from having the armor. So maybe Japan, maybe Italy, uh, the United Kingdom. Actually, the United States can use some light armor. Part The other thing to keep in mind is that uh, some some units are heavier than others, and, and it's, uh, it's when you're transporting units, they when you're transporting units overseas, the heavier armor, you're going to need more transports to transport uh, your divisions than, um, than for... 
uh, lighter armor brigades and motorized brigades and things like that. So light armor is also very portable, and that's something that's worth worth keeping in mind as well. Uh, so I've I've talked about the difference between the uh, the the sorry. The, the, I guess what I should conclude on saying there is that medium armor or just plain old armor is probably the most effective brigade armor brigade in the game, um, especially in during the World War II period. Obviously, if you're going to play like a post World War II, you know, defeat the Soviet Union or defeat America, uh, you know, in, uh, as the Soviet Union or something like that, if you're going to play kind of a post-world or Cold War game and your IC has increased a lot, uh, heavy armor might become a little bit more of an interesting option. It's also, it's it's extremely slow, right? So let's just take a look at the speed here com for comparison. Um, light armor is 10, armor is 8, heavy armor is 7. Now, that will change with technology, right? So, looks like Germany pretty much has this technology upgraded, but um, but yeah, and it's also their heavy tank engine is already at uh, 1943, I think, or so. So they've already upgraded that engine, and it's still it's still slow as hell. So yeah, okay. So how do we actually? design these divisions. Well, I gave you a little bit of a preview earlier. You're going to want one, oops, one uh, armor brigade. Uh, you're At least one, you're going to want uh, at least one motorized brigade. Uh, you're going to want uh, a an artillery brigade. Now, as I said, self-propelled artillery is uh, very expensive in terms of leadership and research to get to, so a lot of countries won't be building these or won't be getting them until quite a lot later. Uh, so you're going to want uh, one of either artillery or direct fire. Uh, your, your direct fire would either be a motorized AA, this would be a very cheap armored division, uh, or a tank destroyer, and this would be an armored division that would be better at uh, piercing. In terms of your support brigade, there is an argument for putting an engineer in an armored division. An engineer will allow an will give an ar armored division a little bit of an easier time crossing rivers uh, and you know going through woods and if they end up having to go through hilly areas or mountains. However, um, as I said before, engineers are really not very good combat divisions and they don't upgrade very well. Uh, and so, armor is one instance where an armored car would probably overall be a better. Um, support division. Uh, however, if you are going to use armored cars as your standard support division for armor, you should try and avoid using your armor in, in forests. Uh, I personally prefer to use armored cars with my armored divisions and engineers with my infantry division, unless I'm playing a country that doesn't have enough leadership to have both of those. Uh, and the reason for that is that I like to use armor where it's best, which is on plains and in desert, and I like to stick to infantry when I'm doing urban combat or, you know, trying to break through a fortified line or going over mountains and things like that I will tend to use either special forces or infantry uh, and you know because they they get less penalties so it's like I said I'm not going to tell you which is best uh, you can you guys can do all the math and 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 figure if you want to get into that but go for it uh, I I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to get into all that uh, I'm just trying to tell you what basic types of divisions you can experiment with and and you know Try different, uh, try different types. See how they work for you, uh, and and you know read these statistics and look at them. So that's that's a pretty standard armored division. Let's uh, switch back to the USA so we can get the superior firepower for a second here. Uh, tag. USA. We've still got this template set up here. Uh, so as the USA, for example, or any country that gets the superior firepower technology, uh, with the 5th Brigade, this is what I was showing you before. This is a completely combined arms uh, armor, armor um, division. And uh, and so this can be a very powerful powerful unit. So if you wanted to make it cheaper, you could switch out the tank destroyer for uh, motorized AA. Um, uh, if you, you you know, like I said, you could also swap the armored car out for uh, for uh, engineers, although not of America, because apparently they don't have engineers in 1944, which is insane. Uh, what else? Um, if you don't have self-propelled art if you don't have self-propelled artillery uh, and, and because you didn't research it um, although I to be perfectly honest I'd be a little bit surprised if you didn't have self-propelled artillery but you did have the fifth brigade uh, you might consider doing something like uh, you know adding another motorized brigade typically though I find that 
having three combat brigades in an armored division is very expensive. I find that the even though these may be something actually, you know, something like this might actually be the strongest armored division you can build or something like this. But this is just so expensive that you're not going to have as many of them on the field, I think. Uh, and I think that's, you know, I think that the uh, a good compromise. Personally, I like to build um, armor, motorized, self-propelled artillery, tank destroyer, and armored car. If I have the luxury of using all of these, I like to build divisions that look like this because I find that this bonus is, is really nice. Uh, the statistics of the unit are pretty well rounded. It doesn't take quite as much um, doesn't take quite as much combat width up. Uh, because it has three support brigades instead of uh, instead of only, only two, uh, and it's uh, you know it's it's reasonably inexpensive to 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 build compared to. Uh, I very very rarely would put more than one armored brigade in a division. I mean, obviously it's going to make a very hard division. It's going to make a very powerful division. They also consume a lot of fuel. And one thing you will notice is that as soon as you are in enemy territory in low infrastructure areas like here for example uh, you if you you know the more fuel hungry your divisions are the faster they will run out of supplies so they may be very fast units like say light armor and be able to go behind enemy lines but I mean I think for example for light for a light armor division uh, you know you could do something like this but say doing like something like that with two mechanized divisions in light armor, well, I mean, that consumes so much fuel that, it, yes, it's going to move at 10 kilometers an hour and go way quickly behind enemy lines. Uh, it's going to run out of fuel so quickly that, that it will quickly lose its speed advantage. Now, if you're using air supply or you're getting you know clever about your supply network, uh, these can be really powerful divisions. Uh, if I was going to build a late war light armor division, if that's something I wanted to do, uh, as the allies, for example, or even as the Axis, I would consider maybe light armor, mechanized, uh, armored car, and uh, you know, s s you know, self-propelled artillery. I believe that self-propelled rocket artillery is also faster uh, than self-propelled artillery. So actually, the unit you would put in here, I think, would be self-propelled rocket artillery. If I recall correctly, it's faster. I just don't have one to play with right now. Uh, that could be a very, uh, very powerful unit. Motorized AA tends to be fairly fast as well, although you can see very quickly here, uh, I'm losing the speed advantage as soon as I add some of those support divisions in. So might actually just make more sense to do something like this. Maybe throw in the uh, self-propelled rocket artillery and that would be that. I think we've covered off armored divisions, we've covered off special forces, we've covered off infantry divisions. I hope I've given you a few, uh, a few designs that are, uh, uh, that are interesting. Uh, I also talked briefly about cavalry and why you would use it uh, instead of motorized. And so just like with most of what I've said, uh, the reasons why you would use cavalry instead of motorized are uh, either because you're a very poor country and simply can't afford it, although that's probably not even worth it. Uh, you're going to use it in low infrastructure areas. Uh, with rougher terrain uh, and possibly to fight partisans where you just don't need powerful units and you want something that's cheaper and doesn't consume fuel. So what about uh, militia and garrisons? Uh, militia and garrisons are actually very useful units, believe it or not. Militia doesn't get the combined arms bonus. It has very shitty statistics overall. It does, however, have a few interesting um, fe features. So it's a, it's a very good unit on the defense. Uh, especially uh, it's one of the only units that has an urban defense bonus so let's look at this plus 15 percent urban defense and we don't have any defensive bonus as the infantry. They get all these uh, um, terrain terrain bonuses in particular, uh, mountains, defense, and things like that. Uh, so I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, so they do have some terrain bonuses. They are in, in general though so weak that those terrain bonuses are probably not worth it. However, their biggest bonus is just how cheap they are. So let's, uh, let's sort this by supply. We can see that militia costs very, very little in terms of supplies. 
they cost a, they cost only 10 officers for one brigade. Uh, by comparison, infantry costs 100 officers, marines cost 130 officers, so that it's just like it's 13 times the officers of, uh, of a brigade of militia, and um, uh, you know, garrisons cost 30, military co police cost 50. So uh, countries that have very low leadership uh, but very high manpower, instead of building highly trained armies, they can build kind of not very highly trained armies made out of militia, but that, that, that are so huge. You know, you can probably, you can support, uh, for, you can support 10 times as much militia with your, uh, with your officers than you can infantry. So it's something that many countries uh, that don't have a lot of leadership may want to consider doing. The two countries that would probably benefit the most from it are the Soviet Union and nationalist China. You could build a gigantic militia army, and then once you've actually successfully defended against your attackers and maybe even made some headway by simply exhausting them with your manpower, uh, you, you would then start to upgrade that unit and start to actually advance and... and uh, and go on the offensive with more powerful units. It's an interesting strategy, and I'm going to make a whole video on the... It's called the Human Wave Strategy, and uh, I'll make a whole video on that. There are also some really interesting circumstances where militia can be used just behind your lines in terms of defense. They're, they're a very useful unit in... Um, in uh, I use them a lot when I do defense in depth type strategies as the Soviet Union, uh, potentially even as France, uh, although that's a bit dicey. Uh, they're also useful for, in the same way that cavalry are, they're very slow, they move slower than infantry. So they can be somewhat useful for partisan suppression, they take a little bit, they, they consume a little bit less supplies. Um, so they're also good in areas that are very low terrain. Uh, they could be good in areas where, with low terrain, where you're unlikely to be fighting a sophisticated opponent. So, you know, something like, uh, I don't know if you, Britain might be able to use them in, uh, in, in some of these areas and stuff. If you wanted to invade Persia or something, you might be able to do so with, um, you might be able to do so with militia. Uh, however, uh, generally speaking, their best use is, is for what I was talking about, defense in depth and the human wave strategy. Uh, they can also be used instead of garrisons. They do consume a little bit more supply than garrisons, but they take less leadership. So uh, that's a, that's a trade-off for sure. Um, and I think my phone just rang there, so I'm sorry if you guys hear that in this video. Uh, unfortunately, I can't just stop the video every time my phone rings. Uh, right. So the, anyway, they're an interesting unit. Uh, their biggest advantage is how is is how few officers they take. Um, so uh, they are an interesting unit, and they are not totally useless. Uh, they are also, if you are going to use military police for suppression, uh, they are probably the best unit to to attach military police to because they're just so cheap. Uh, I don't see much point in this. If I was going to build, I don't use military police very often. I also don't play as the Axis all the time, but uh, I don't play as Germany all the time, uh, but I don't use military police very often, but if I'm going to use them kind of for historical flavor, I'm probably just going to attach them to a militia unit. Of course, if I attach them to an infantry unit, I would get one extra point of suppression, but this to me is, is just, uh, you know, this is costing 150 officers. Where is it? This this costs 150 officers, uh, whereas this is costing 60 officers. So, you know, there there are circumstances where militia is uh, is uh, you can can be used instead of uh, instead of infantry. Uh, I, like I said, you can also you might also want to use them. Uh, instead of a garrison unit, something like this, instead of a garrison unit, uh, because the, if you are leadership poor and you want to save every ounce of leadership, uh, you might use them. Garrisons, though, and now it's good that we get to garrisons now. Garrisons are a very interesting unit as well. They are painfully slow. They move at one kilometer per hour, so they'll need to be strategically redeployed if you want to move them around the map. However, they are very, very cheap in terms of supplies. Uh, so garrisons are the ideal unit to place in overseas uh, ports. Uh, so if you are playing as the United Kingdom and you want to protect some key islands um, like Malta, 
or Hong Kong, perhaps, if that's something you want to do. Or, um, you know, Singapore, very important. Uh, ports in general are ideal places to put garrisons. They consume very few supplies. Uh, they also will dissuade the AI from invading. Um, they'll dissuade the AI from invading uh, and attacking your your uh, you know taking taking important supply ports and stuff like that uh, y they allow you because they cost a lot less in terms of officers and uh, they cost a lot less in terms of uh, they cost a lot less in terms of officers they cost a lot less in terms of they don't take as many supplies uh, as infantry uh, they are it's much easier to maintain uh, and you you won't need to be sending quite so many supplies uh, around the world if you have overseas possessions so garrisons are very good for that and they're very good also even as Germany uh, I would usually put garrisons in my ports uh, simply because I just don't want uh, I don't want the UK or the USA landing troops like here and if I put garrisons there it will dissuade them from doing so uh, garrisons are have fairly good defense statistics their defense statistics however and this is a common misconception they are not better at defense than infantry at the beginning of the game they may be depending on what your technology is infantry surpasses them and becomes a better defensive unit uh, except perhaps in certain terrains let's take a quick look here do garrisons have a terrain advantage not really no not really no. So, uh, so garrisons, uh, so infantry are, are better than, than garrisons. However, if you use garrisons in your ports that don't consume a lot of supplies, uh, if the enemy does land uh, on either side of it, the garrison won't hold out for too long, but they should be able to hold out until you're able to send another unit. So, so a good defense strategy for Germany would be to garrison every single port along this along this area here, and if and when the Allies do land, like they've done here. Uh, you would have mo mobile motorized units closer to your supply lines, but you could quickly dispatch those and encircle any troops. Garrisons are also cheap, so if they, you know, if they do get uh, encircled and captured uh, and taken off the map, it's just not the end of the world compared to a valuable infantry division. If an infantry division is, if you defend Malta with an infantry division and that infantry division gets gets uh, stranded there, uh, it's a bit of a pain. It's a bit of a shame to use to lose an infantry uh, division where a garrison division would be less of a severe loss. So that pretty much covers off uh, lands land units. The only brigade we weren't able to look at was the SP rocket artillery. Uh, it's, gonna be, it's something you're going to use pretty selectively, mostly for those fast exploitation light armor mechanized units. So now that we've talked about the uh, different di division composition types, I want to quickly cycle back and clarify something about combat width uh, or frontage, uh, which is essentially the same thing. Um, so I mentioned, uh, when we talked about infantry divisions, I mentioned that the most popular infantry division among Hearts of Iron 3 players is the 3 Brigade Infantry Division, and then you would attach you know, an artillery, uh, an artillery brigade or what have you. Uh, and I also mentioned the alternative, which would be something like this, or like this. Uh, there's there's a couple reasons that explain why why this one is better. Uh, so we can look at the the Eastern Front here, in 1944. Uh, those are, that's armor. Let's take a look at some infantry. Uh, so if I attack into into this province. Uh, the combat width of a province is 10, as I stated earlier, and I think I actually slipped up and said 12 at first, and you know, uh, you'll, you'll understand very quickly why I said that. Uh, you, if, if you put, if we have four divisions of infantry and we attack into this province, uh, that, uh, that comes up to 12 brigades. Uh, and the combat width is only 10, so the question is, do we get a stacking penalty? And the answer is no, because it rounds down to the division. Uh, so you're able to squeeze in the extra two brigades uh, because it, it counts it as 10, basically. Uh, I don't know how the math works it out that way. I don't know if it's sort of intended or not, but that's what it comes down to. So 
it, 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 12 brigades in these ones with their, these ones don't have support brigades, but if they did have support grades, 12 brigades plus their support brigades amounts to 10. Now, if I had six units uh, with two brigades in each of them, that would come out to 12 and you would get this, the, the stacking penalty. Uh, there's another reason. There's another reason why uh, you would, st so, you know, and I guess you could ask the question, well, why wouldn't I just use, uh, you know, six, why wouldn't I just put six divisions with uh, two brigades in each, in, in each division and get the combined arms from having a mix of, say, anti-tank and artillery or artillery and engineer? Uh, well, the problem with that is that when a, when a division engages in combat, as the combat goes on, the org goes down. Now, the support brigades, which unfortunately we don't have in this stupid scenario, uh, the, the artillery brigades, even if the artillery brigade is at zero org, it, it doesn't cause the unit to, to retreat. Uh, a division retreats when all of its uh, when all of its combat uh, brigades uh, are, are are at zero organization. Brigades don't retreat, by the way. Only divisions retreat. So uh, brigades. Uh, so basically. A unit with three, com a division with three combat brigades is less likely to retreat or will last longer in combat before it retreats or cancels its combat if it's on the uh, on the on the attack uh, than a division with two brigades. And if you have, say, a stack of four brigades like this or six brigades, uh, once one division retreats, it kind of creates a chain reaction because of the way that divisions and brigades target each other in combat. Uh, if one unit, if one division is retreat, retreating and is taken out of combat, uh, the other units are are more likely to be targeted by more units at once, and the whole the whole thing kind of falls apart. Uh, so basically, the three brigades uh, infantry division uh, is is better in terms of uh, in terms of the amount of frontage and the likelihood of getting a stacking penalty. And a variety of things. Now that doesn't mean you should never use a two brigade infantry division. So I just want to reiterate that there are situations where, you know, it's it's still worth it. And like I said, the AI doesn't really do things properly anyway. So you may be fighting divisions that are that are not optimally put together. Uh, just just to reiterate as well, uh, I also mentioned that you would put two combat brigades in an armor division typically, which I which is what I do. You can certainly put a third. Uh, the, the reason, in my opinion, is, well, first of all, at the start of the game, armor has two combat width. There is a technology that put, cuts that in half. Uh, however, um, this is just too expensive. And that's that's really what it comes down to. This is no matter how much more effective a unit like this is in combat, it's too expensive. It consumes too much fuel, consumes too much supplies. So that just just to just to clarify that combat width thing, and I think it's good to cycle back and review that now that we've gone through the different division types. Another thing I want to point out uh, as a little little bonus at the end of this episode is we talked a lot about division design in this video. You can also think about this in terms of core design. So you know maybe you can't decide whether you want to use anti-tank or artillery or maybe you mostly want to use artillery but you want to have some elements of anti-tank or even anti-aircraft in your in your uh, our, our land forces well one thing you could do for example is uh, put uh, two brigades of artillery one of anti-tank and one of uh, one of um, anti-air for example and you could you could you know, do your build based on having different support units in different divisions within one core, and then when you're in, when you're ordering units around, you can try and use that core as a sort of functional unit, and that might be a very very valid strategy, especially on these you know the Eastern Front with these big you know these these big epic battles with lots of units in them, uh, you know. And it could also be good for even isolated fronts, uh, I don't know, as the United Kingdom or something, where you're probably only going to deploy one core, and you want to have some different elements in that core and, and kind of do the math. So that can be an interesting approach as well. You can start to think about uh, what units you, you know, how you spread your support brigades among your your infantry and armored divisions and and you know make some sort of multifunctional cores that that have different strengths and weaknesses so that's it for the uh, for the uh, division building 
uh, tutorial here. Obviously, we have not, I have not talked too, too much about technology and how technology affects the choices you're going to make in terms of what you build. Uh, I, that, that's got to be a separate episode. They are, they are profoundly interrelated, but I don't think there's any way, there was no way to condense that into this episode, and I preferred to kind of really stick to this production screen. Uh, we will be doing some practical unpausing the game and watching combat unfold, uh, watching technology and, and espionage and all of that in upcoming episodes. And so hopefully with a couple more of these ridiculously long videos, you'll be able to dive into the game. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, and I'll be back soon.